tortured soul shall find rest beyond the river. not what you have confidence in. See, as a man God's grace will have lived the world, I can say to you, it's not, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's something 
you can do beyond what you wish that you are not going to glory in seven years of medical school you are not going to glory in being a doctor that for you is, is, is nothing to be compared with what God is doing it's not something natural it takes the strength of God such that I'm not talking about you know the number of times wow why, why do we want to do more things? It's for, it's for comparison. You don't want to, to be left behind. It says, in the cross, be my what? Be my glory. That nothing I become is important to me. Nothing I'm becoming is of so much value that, 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 that it cannot bend to the word of God. That there's nothing I'm... See, men that the cross is their glory, God can take them anywhere. Because wherever they get to, that is not the reason or the basis for why they are talking. Their glory, their, their emphasis, their pride is not who they are. It's who he is that is in them. Will you ask the Lord this morning? In the cross, be my glory. You see, for some of us, your glory is in marriage. You are waiting for a good day, you will get married. And it may be, oh, men that God will take far. Those things are not their glory. Their glory is first the cross. Meaning that even if God take away the coat of many colors, they will still stand serving Jesus. Can you ask the Lord this morning that your glory will not be anything else save the cross of Christ? Your glory will not be anything else? Your glory will not be what you can become or what you cannot become? Your glory will not be in your own capacity? But your glory will be in the cross of Jesus. Can that be your prayer this morning? The Lord help me not to glory in self-confidence. The Bible says that we have those that worship God in spirit who have no confidence in the flesh. Can you ask the Lord? Can you ask the Lord? Can we take that song again? That in? The cross only the river. in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever. Till my rapture so shall find beyond the river. Can you make that in? Can you ask the Lord with the whole of your heart? That will be your glory. Do you guys remember the rich young ruler? Do you remember the rich young ruler? Do you remember? you realize that that young man had a destiny with God but you see what he has what he had what he has gathered over the years could not bend to the cross what he had become was so much that the, 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 the cross could not be permitted and you realize that after that time he was forgotten there was no record as to what he became again you see when we are talking about the cross being your glory maybe because you don't have shoe you don't have cloth now easy to say the cross is your glory you are going to realize when increase come you realize that if you have not made a decision early what you are becoming because your identity because the Bible says they call him what the rich young ruler he doesn't have a name because what he has become has become his identity may you allow the cross now before you get travel far so dear father this morning this is our cry we don't want to be like that rich young ruler a man of great capacity but what he had become could not bend to the cross father let there be nothing that we have become or we are becoming that cannot bend to the cross Amen. let there be nothing that we possess that we cannot lay down our Discussing how the meeting will go, the plan we are planning as far from looking. 
So on that basis, I can come and say, you know, you can, you, 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 you your step can change. You, you know, it's on UK now. You know, pounds and, and naira is not the same. Four hundred pounds to Nigeria money is about how many thousand? I'm, I'm not saying they give me four hundred pounds so that you don't come and carry me. Over. Nobody give me four hundred pounds. I'm just saying that pounds to Nigeria money is not the same. So I can on the ground that I have disciples across the empire, you know, just make a decision and say, oh, we will move. Or say, no, you see, see, you can make decisions based on what you are becoming. And that is not Jesus. Have you not realized that sometimes why you buy some clothes that you buy because you have money? Have you realized? When you don't have money, do you, you think about some clothes? Even if they show you, what, what will you say? What will you say? Thank you, or you think about it. But when you have money, what happens to you? Every good thing, it, it, the shoulders are being beside your house that you've never seen the clothes in that shop before. Your eyes are always closed. Then money comes. I say, hey, madam, you are always here. Hey, I never knew you are shop. When money has a way of opening your eyes. No, when you are eating to the square meal, there are things you see. When you are not eating, there are things that cannot take your attention. What I'm saying is that it takes, it takes, it takes, it takes the grace of God for the cross to be your glory. It takes the grace. You see, I'm speaking this way because none of you will be small. Oh, oh, oh. You see, you see the way you're asking the prayer is as if you have a choice. We, we have insisted on God in this meeting that none of you will be small. And when we say small, we are not talking about buying jets. We have left that rent. We are talking about mattering, becoming a matter in the matter of God, becoming a force to reckon with, becoming such an individual that God can commit Himself to. So when we say in the cross, be my glory, it's not easy. I've had times where I needed to take position at work. You know, you know. When I I have a number of them who are doctors, medical students. Those of them are not finished. So you don't, don't worry, finish first. Unless somebody call you, I say, doctor, hey! You don't understand that pride and humility, you know, there's a thin line between them. You know, I say, yeah, me? Hey. When I was a student, you can say, hey, 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 no, not MBPS anywhere. You were in. No, you will always look at you first. Are you are you oriented in terms of person? But you see, while I'm responding that way, if I'm an ordinary person, you are not paying me. Right? But why is it paying me? I feel that even if you don't value human being, you don't value those two. You have one in your family. You see, if it's easy, why not all of you go and study medicine? But well, you see, I can lie that it's a principle that respect to word, or no, it's you it is still flesh. My master was called the devil. This is God in human form. They called him visible. The disciples were saying, ah, we won't be anything. Say, let's go to the other, to the other town. What I'm telling you is that don't worry. If you don't allow God now, to make the cross your identity. To make the cross the, the, the I'm, I'm going to on that now. To make the cross your essence. Such that any other thing you are becoming is just what? A secondary. Any other thing you are becoming is just an addition. We find that like that rich young ruler, a time will come where God can no longer be a ruler over your life. Money is powerful. Hope you don't know. You don't, or you don't know. Oh, you don't know. Okay. Let five thousand enter your account now. Some of you five thousand. You didn't borrow it to five hundred k. Bam. You know, some people say that their problem is money. I've I've tested some people. I give them money. Their problem is not money. Is that they lack wisdom? Because a man that lacks direction, if you give him money, he will still waste it. He will still waste it. He will still do what he's not supposed to do with it. So you think that you don't like money. Let's put money in your account. You will see that those clothes you do not buy it because you don't have money. 
those shoes that you did not buy because you don't have the means of buying them. Those places you could not go is because you know when you don't have money to go somewhere. Where, where, how will you go there before in the first place? But what I'm saying is that this is an early time in our journey to make Christ go, across the world your glory. Glory means to make it your essence, to make it the basis of your decision, the basis of your relationship, the basis of all that you are doing, the basis of ministry, the basis of interaction, the basis of business. See, if the cross is not your glory, when you do business to a point, a point comes in business where you need to compromise. A man who's the cross is his glory, he will, he will eject out of that label because it's not what you know. Let me add to what I'm telling you, in case you don't know. Do you know that? Should I, should I tell you? Should I tell you? Let me, I should tell you. No, you, 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 you cannot receive it. You are looking, you are looking, you are looking, you are looking yo, you know, life is hey, sir. I had, I think I told some time before, I had access to about 20 million euros. But that money was going to come. It was a project. The project was 86 million. I was the procurement officer. 40 million will do the work. 40 million will do the work. We were told that after, you know, he did not send me. I sent the details of the business, of the who, who are buying. They called me and said that, that I did, I, 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 and I made a mistake. Now you go market. They said that we should rewrite it to fit a disease million. Era. Even though 40 million have finished work. So at the end of the day, we are going to have 46 million era profit. And I will still have more gain from the work. Home. So we now share it 60 40. So I'm going to get at least 18 20 million era for that work. I said, how will I do this great thing? Against what? God. I left the procedure with this game. If they give me 20 million era, and I come and tell you guys, glory to Jesus. And I came with it. Hey, you know, they went between Beku and Ka. Hey, I've entered two of them before. When they put you in Beku, you know, the way you call it, Beku, as this entry port O, you are entering together. You will feel it when you enter car. Even Porto is not a threat. Porto is a privilege. It's a place to test that the absorber is, is working. If I brought that kind of system and pack it, I say, vroom, say what we say? Ministry is what? Ministry is going to the next level. But you see, that money will have been gotten by making more than 100 percent profit from the business of the government. I said, no. How will I face my, my disciples? How will I face a generation and say that that don't stand for Jesus? I know they've done the business because I've given them all the answer of the business already. I've given them the document and everything. So when we are saying, cross, I'm not telling you rocket science. If that won't be your glory, you will speak in tongue and collect the money. Kabaku, kabaku, kabaku. You will collect the money. You say, you, when, when, when you go, you go and repent. Say, Jesus, have mercy, have mercy. You go and pay tight in your village. You go and build one, one small church. I say, to, to the God of heaven. I'm talking about almost 20 million naira. They didn't tell me. I was the one who was. I, they called me. And they are books to the money. So when I tell you, we are not talking, we are not talking rocket science. If Christ has not been your glory, you will cheat Jesus. You will cheat, you will compromise. Hey, you will you. You know, you know maybe you're going to see 100,000 naira. You are happy. I'm talking of, of almost 20 million. Maybe I give you 20 million. Mannequin will, will pull up. Hey, hey, hey. You, you, will be, you will not be selling airport again. You'll be letting me You know, give that guy that kind of money. Man, this money that I'm borrowing. Ah! Teacher, we, you know, this uh, Zoom uh, coda. Zoom coda. We'll buy a new one. Other sound will be as if we're in the. You know, ah! you know now, set up everything. Who go on? But you see, if the cross is not your glory, you are going to compromise your faith. If you have not compromised, it's only because the devil has not gotten your appropriate size. You know, the devil understands what you like. And he doesn't know so much. It's step by step. It's step by step. He tries this one. If you fall for it, okay, this is one surprise. The question is, what can buy? What is worthy enough to purchase your soul? 
if the cross is not your glory, the devil can go the extra mile to purchase your soul. He can go any length. If the length that you want is fame, he can go as faster to bring you to a lamb life. If only your soul what? will be purchased. My glory ever till my ransom so shall find rest be your You be that song. Can you ask Jesus? Can you beg Jesus? Can you beg Jesus? Can you beg Jesus? Let me tell you one more thing. So next week that we're not discussing, discussing rocket science. You know, okay, let me not mention the old details so I don't know what I'm talking about. You were to pay me a money. Yeah, okay, we, we are suit that we are doctor and we look into it. We are not noise makers. You know what you like is noise makers. People that make noise about who they are. No, no, we are not like that. We can have 20 million and still wear our palm. It doesn't change anything. It's not about this. It's not, you know, it's, it's babies that improve their wardrobe when they have more money. It's, you are still a baby. When money comes, it's not about what it's about the need. You know, it's children who are still learning, learning to grow. We are going to pay me a money. I was called aside, and they told me that because of the number of days I've used, they will pay me normally, maybe in, in 30 days. They are going to pay me because I work 10 days, they'll pay me 10 days or 17 days, like that. The man has said no, that actually they can work it, that they will pay me for the whole month. I said, ow, oh, so I should not worry. I should just tell him how much I can give. I only work then. But this man took upon himself that I'm a good brother. That I, when I just not, I'm very committed to service. I'm hardworking. I'm patient. I'm, I'm a patient dog. Patient, any, any patient that, I don't, that does not like me. He, 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 he has problem. Because you must like me. How would you like me? But like, so he said, like they're going to, he said they'll give me the whole month salary. But he asked me a question, how much am I willing to give to him? So it means that they will pay me for what I did not do. And when I also what? Pay him for what he did. Can you see the logic? So, but we know when he, when he told me, I thought I was living in another world. So people still do this thing. So I have to go on first. I said, Holy Spirit, is this real? So I now pick up courage. Go on, Mr. Sir. Thank you, sir. Pay me for the days that I worked. And I and now understood that several of my other colleagues are doing like that. They are doing like because I'm not the first. Because I know that one of my friends was saying, I one of my roommate then. Ah. So I was wondering what he was talking about. That's what he was talking to me about. And these are Christians. If the cross is not your glory, you will find out that you have a price tag. Money is going to buy you. Nobody knew because and even that something is such that they will take the money from the account of the of, of the of the of the of the work I was doing and they will pay you. There's nothing to show that I took any money. My question is, when no eyes is looking at you, what will your decision be? If the cross is not your glory, <laughs> then there's no that you will not compromise your faith. If you have not made up your mind. It is Jesus or nothing. Money can what? Money can buy you. So I want to teach on the cross and the kingdom people. But I've heard this already, anyways. Let me just add one more scriptures in a move. Can we hear me? Am I making sense? Are you sure? I need to ask yourself what can buy you? What is your price tag? If your price tag is to be a, is if is your goal is to be holding mic, that's your price tag. The devil can assist you to be holding mic because that is the price you will want to pay. If your price tag 
is to be a star a a a, 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 a record singer in the world the devil doesn't have a problem with that he can assist you to that journey only if it will purchase your soul only if it will distract you from the emphasis of god i'm not saying that you cannot become that but you see you must ensure that the cross is your word is your glory glory means that that is your Mm. What, what is your problem if the cross is not your glory people are going to suggest to you by what you are looking like ah, sister ah, people like you should not be doing like this what because you see somehow somehow they are trying to say that Sleep on the floor, we sleep with Thanksgiving. Nothing is nothing changes. I was in the Kiri to minister. I took two shoes, and one other brother was there who may be listening online. Eh, this is your shoe is bad, you are a leader. Take the second one. And I went back home to one. That is there's no glue. That is it is not the shoe that we wear that makes us important. And what I am ow by the grace of God, not by what I wear. My fiance is doing well. She gets me the clothes. But I'm not what I am by the good clothes I wear. And what I am by what? By the grace of God. What are you? Are you what you are? Or are you what you are looking like by what you do? No. In this kingdom, we are not what we have by what we are. What we are by what? By the grace of God. So at any point, I'm more connected to grace than to any other thing. Anything that will cut me short of grace, I would rather run. As my brother said, he, you see that? You see what he was telling us? The sister said, What did that sister say? I love you. What did, what did my brother do? He ran. I know you. You will not run. He said, Okay, okay, okay. You love me. Okay. How did God show you? Uh, once you start like that, you are finished. Even Joseph, our forefather. In his own time, you know, there's a between run and flee. KJV use flee. Do you usually watch Tom and Jerry? Tom, the way Tom always run is flee. Run. If you run, you'll be caught. It is flee. Your leg rolls like a spear. Thank you. Okay. Do you get what I'm saying? You see, Iran, Richmond, what must you do? You run. Don't. Even Peter, when Peter was sinking, you know, Peter did not say, hey, I'm saying, hey. he shouted, Master. When they lost the axe head, how did they say? Say, Alas, you borrowed it. There is, a, there is something attached to crying in this kingdom. We don't just keep quiet. I say, You know, the Bible says that if a woman touched the secret.
That's why, for me, I don't take, I don't give room for too many testimonies. If, if I don't know who you are, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Over Quran, you, the Lord Jesus, so praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Yesterday, today, you know, all those things are not true. Having worked in the public space, some of those breaks that people talk about, they are not true. Because you can make money unrighteously and come and say, God did it. If I have made that 20 million naira, Pastor, that is my point. Uh uh. My girl is so tight in the 20 million. I know I have 20 million. 20,000 carry. I can't. Mr. Bono, I don't have to be happy. I have a million. I have a million. I just take care of some things. And they will say, that brother is giving to Jesus. Whereas, I need someone to get me the Living Bible. TLB. If you have it on your phone, you can get that to me. TLB. I'm going to read NKJV here, but I need something TLB. I'm talking about the cross and what? Oh, very good. The cross and the kingdom people. And you know this Easter period, is it not? And of course, see, one thing is cardinal about Easter is the cross of Christ. Carrying the cross, God got died, was killed. You have it there. Thank you, Bolu. So, can you arm Bolu with the mic? Let me arm out with the mic. That's one of the early disciples too. Early. Bolu. Oh, early Abi Abi, you come with. So, I'm out with him. So, I want to read NKJV here. I want to show to you something about the cross. You know, there's one thing I thought in that is your meeting. This is my brother here. He's doing well. He's doing well. Doing well. Doing well. Doing well. Doing well. Doing well. Doing some friends, they are not they are not very good though. But see those guys, they will go and steal the answer at the back of New General Mathematics. One answer will. They will now walk their way. I don't know how they always walk it. They will just walk it, walk it, walk it, walk it. Say, ah, hey, Aki, Aki, I got the answer. <laughs> so I was thinking the guy was smart. You know what I did? I now did a test. You know, because I was that good in secondary school. I will now set my own question. The answer is in my pocket. They will now struggle, struggle. And whereas what I just did in the question was just to remove one thing and put, I just alternated the answer. If it was a smart person, it's just to look at what alternated and get the answer again. So, the fact And still look like something, but doesn't mean it's what is correct. So I dare you, don't jump what the process. Don't be too excited about what you are becoming that you think that the process is not necessary. Even though God said, "Let that blind and does what," there was that. Do you realize that as God, even though it was God, it took Him six days to finish everything. My question is, if it was God, can't He finish it in a day? Why six days? Why did it take him that long? Because even though he's God, he's also bound to what? Process. If God is bound to process, who are you? Are we together? So, let's read. Yeah, go on then. So, but, uh, by the way, let me read from here. Let me give you context from NKJV. Let me read from verse, go my time. 37, 38, 39. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two. From where? From where? From where? Top to bottom. I know some of you are laughing already. May the Lord help your heart. Laugh, let me catch you. Top to what? 
bottom. Do you realize that he did not tear from bottom to top? Do you know what that means? God did that because to show that it was not the work of a man. If the cutting tore from bottom to top, those Pharisees would have said it was somebody that mistakenly tore the cutting. But from top, you know, the top is very high up, so that nobody can claim that the subject of resurrection was a sham. Because it was from where? Top to what? Bottom. But that's not where I'm going. Okay. Where am I now? That's what? 39. That's where I'm going. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that, he cried out like this and breathed his last. He said, truly. Sorry. Let me come again. Sorry. I missed that. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man this man is what? So I want to read it in TLB. Is TLB already? So read TLB for us. Then Jesus uttered another loud Please, cry. Please, I, I need you to be allowed. I want to, this is I want to pray. I want to show you something here about the matter of the cross. Because if the cross begins to find its place in our lives, we are going to really see that we have not seen anything yet. I found that God can put money in our hands. So it's a matter of how the cross has affected the will of the Father in us. But read on. Yes? Then Jesus uttered another loud cry. Yes? And dismissed the spirit. Yes? And the curtain in the temple was split apart. Yes? From top to bottom. Yes? When the Roman officer standing beside the cross yes. saw how he dismissed the spirit. Yes? He exclaimed, yes. Truly, this was the son of God. Huh? Is it TLB? Is that TLB? Yes. Mm. There's something that's... Ah. That TLB, I didn't see TLB. Ah. Uh, uh, look at my phone. That is, is, is it TLB? Maybe I made a mistake. That's the living Bible, right? Eh. I know it's fine now. Okay, my time, right? I think my phone. I can't see that. My phone. Let me see my phone. Thank you. Don't look too much, Joe. Because I say bring tap, bring phone. It's it time for everything. Okay. I think I opened it down. So please, sorry. Give me a minute. Please. Eh. Ah. Okay. It's, it's possible that it's not the one. But just please bear with me. Just give me a minute. Let me, let me confirm that. Confirm that. So, Bolu, check. I found a living Bible. There's TLB. Yes. No, no, no. Ah, not TPT. TPT is, TPT is another realm. TPT is another, is another realm. Okay, let me see. I think I've found it. I've, I think I've found it. I think I've found it. Please, just bear with me, please. Bear with me. Oh, the spirit. Okay. Okay. Oh, the spirit. Help me. Help me. I trust you. Trust you. Just give me a minute, please. Sorry. I want to find. Thank you. Okay. We read best what? 39, right? Okay. So, will you come and read this one? So, I don't know which version of TV is that. Maybe that's updated version. So, read this one. So, let's go. That's nice, my emphasis. Oh, quickly, let's move. When the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he had died, he exclaimed, Truly, this was the Son of God. Thank you. Read again. When the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he had died, 
he exclaimed, truly, this was the son of God. What made him conclude that this was the son of God? How he died. It is a body. How he was, how he died. You know, I feel that somebody's living should be the reason why it should be. That even in death, Jesus was still bringing sons to glory. The Bible says, when he saw what? When he saw how he died. Now, what killed Jesus? The cross. I mean, what terminated that life? It is the cross. When we talk about the cross, the cross is an implement of death. So when Jesus said, carry your cross and follow me, what he just is saying is that, bear in your body the emblem of what? Of a daily dying. Meaning that anybody that sees you, you are a potential subject to be killed. Of course, that's how I was in that time. But because of my want of time, the Bible says that when he saw how he was, how he died. So I saw, my brother, and that's what the problem with us. Why people are not believing in our Jesus? It's because they are not seeing how we are dying. You are not dying. of sin. What that means is that the death that killed Jesus killed that many people. All of us. So Jesus did not just die for you. He died as you. Bible says that when they saw how he was, how he my question is, how are you dying? When we look at you, are there any are there any are there any any evidences of a man who the cross is killing because just said carried out daily, meaning that death is what is every day. This way you are talking, does it show that the cross has affected your life? A man that the cross has affected, it also affects your tongue, it also affects what you say. This is your Christianity that does not have boundary, any trend, you are there any slang. In fact, when we give you a mic to come and sing, you will start with the slang. You have turned the altar of our father. It has been declared. That's what Papa was saying. The weeping series. You have, you have turned the altar of God as a showbiz, as a place to express anything that comes to your mind. The Bible says, when they saw how, how he died. What happened? You know, you know, you know where St. Children is? These are top most soldiers. If it was an ordinary guy that believed, I'm not surprised. Ordinary people believe anything. This is somebody who is high ranking. And when it's only the preaching, you know, he didn't preach to him. When he saw how he died, so I understood. If every one of us is dying, people be getting saved every day. If truly the cross is having effect upon our lives. God is going to be reaping several souls in the kingdom. But you see, when we look at our lives, there's no evidence of death. You are still as alive as we came to Jesus. What you used to say is what you are still saying. How you used to see things has not changed. Your perspective about life, the cross has not changed. This is your appetite that cannot be curtailed. It's still the same. Your principles and perspective of life still remains the same. You know, the apostles told Jesus, said, Master, ah, how would they disrespect you? Let's go down fire. Jesus said, Don't you know the, of which spirit are you? What was saying that the kind of spirit that you, you are carrying? But you see, when the cross took effect upon them, these were the same men that they abused and they were beaten. And we say, they counted it all joy. They were happy to be beaten and abused in the name of the Lord. Before, they were self-defense people. Peter would take a knife and... Phew. But after 
after that engagement, Peter became somebody that you can even bound him and beat him and imprison him. And their statement is that they are happy that they are part of what God is doing. Are you dying? Where are the scars that the cross is killing something in you? Where are the evidences? Where are the tombstone? Tombstone story of your death? You see, if we cannot trace how you are dying, then people will not believe God through you. So life will be lived 70 years and you will have lived the life. You will only be doing cake. Then go, my fiance does cake. We'll make money. You will only be doing cake. I mean, putting 40 years of kindergarten in the life. As far as God is concerned, you are still a baby wearing pampas. You are a small man in a big clothes. But what makes us men in this kingdom is the degree of the death we are dying. Are you dying? Elijah. Death happening to you. This is your love for money that you are telling you to, to change. Say no, 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 no. Are you dying? Are you dying to money? Are you dying to influence? Are you dying to the applause of men? Are you dying to the claps of men? Are you dying to, to the approval? Some of you, until somebody says it's fine, you can't believe it's fine. You need someone's approval to be happy. You need someone's approval. You need somebody to reapprove. And when someone says it's not fine, you are disturbed. You are looking for how to go and change it. You need to borrow money. You need to die. Say when they saw how how he died. Are you dying? Because we says that except a corn of wheat, this what falls down what and die. It's what it abided in. Are you now wondering why it look as if we are plenty and there's no life? Because the death that killed Jesus has not killed us. The death that exterminated Jesus' life has not become a right in our life. When I was telling you, I, I, you, know, you think it's because I don't like money. Who, who doesn't like good things? You think it's easy to be entering bus, traveling from that fast day. If I have my own e-locks, doctor is just... Is, I'll be entering three states. I have new invitations, but I can't be traveling up and down. And I will say that I bought the, the, the motto for God's purpose. But you see, a man whose cross is walking in, you understand that life does not consist by what? By what you have. Life is not a function of what you have. That is not how we do life here. So either we are bound our base, we are still the law. We are not going to use our disciples as we can know that. You see, I can decide that when there's a lack that I have, I know disciples that will answer it with thanksgiving. Who oh, it will be a privilege under God to serve their father. But you see, we knew, we have been taught that we don't convert living stones to bread. Let it be God that moved their heart. We don't move anybody. Anybody that gives, that's because God taught you how to give. Keep, keep your money. And that's why disciples know me. You need to be close to give me something. But I'm going to you. So that you don't you think that we are laboring for your money. Keep your money. We're surviving. You dying? Are you wondering why you are like this? Would it be that the cross has not settled upon your life? Are you wondering why your talk is still casual? Are you wondering? Are you wondering why, even though you can say you are preaching something, people are not getting converted? You know, I don't know if I told you. A lady came to the office, a Muslim, pregnant or not pregnant, I'm not sure. She said that we was talking, like wrote for her. She went home. She now messaged me after all. That doctor, are you married? No, my first problem is that Muslim ladies are very complicated. Maybe the loss is around for me to charge someone's wife. So I wanted to tell her very fast. 
Now you charge me first, too. Is you that collected my number in the hospital? Not me. So, but before I did that, I was about to type it. said that your face looks calm. Nah, uh-uh. that's interesting. I thought that was, you no, know, I was very hard. She so now said, it's not. I said, it's true. I said, thank you very much. Now I said, when she came to the hospital, and she came very sad. And but during our discussion, she just found out that she, the, the bodies are lifted. And that's why she had to just message me. And wow. And what, what really happened? I would have told her, I see, when you meet a man in whom the cross is working, even his good money is the spirit. I've seen people that became disciples, but I said, How are you doing? And that was enough for the first time. So I understood that if the cross begins to work upon your life, even your normal chances carry different meaning. So you don't need plenty of words to bring conviction. You only need to say the right word by the Spirit, and God begins to wire something in the heart of that person. And end of the day, the person is asking, What can I do to be saved? And I can tell you stories about the other one is the Muslim. She's pregnant. Muslim, pregnant. In that same consulting room, she gave her life to Christ. I thought she would go home and think about being a disciple. She became a disciple right in the consulting room. She came to the hospital for, 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 for discipleship. We pregnant. She, she, I explained her to her house. God must save me. To her house. When she goes to her house, you know, I thought she would tell her simply that I'm, I'm a doctor. She said, This is my pastor. So I knew that when the cross began to walk, even your casual discussion on medicine, it could be normal and a delicate yes and no. But you see, it means something else in their heart. It carries a different weight in their spirit. I know they're asking, What kind of man are you? The secret is the cross. Because when the cross comes upon your life, it crushes. And the more you die, the more you live. The more death walks inside you, the more life surges out. So people come around you, they're talking to people, and the only way they can describe the person is that either they come around you, they find everybody and so. The cross. So when that aim says that in the cross, be my glory. I'm not teaching rocket science. It's what by the grace of God we have experienced. That if the cross is at work in you, you will know be dying. Dying to ego. Dying to, you know, I know you. You know what to do all the time. I mean, you're very smart. That your clo clo brain. When the cross begins to work, everything you've always planned that all before will start feeling. Oh, you don't know. You think it Everything you think was working, the cross will first kill it. Every, it, will kill it. So if you are not accountable, you, you will leave Jesus. Because you feel that failure means that God has gone. Because sometimes God uses failure to make you wise. The cross. Paul said, I will glory in nothing. Sometimes someone is here. I, 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 can, I, can, I can hear in my spirit. You have you issues with your, with your relationship. Well, I don't think relationship is, is wrong by what I can pick in the spirit. It is because the both of you have not embraced the cross. But relationship for me, in my own definition, is an extension of God to continue practical work upon you. Because now you are two. Before, you say I go efficient and you must tell somebody. It's a dealer. Organo. I know who he was. He can, he can, he, now he has to tell. You say don't go matter the anointing that day. We were still a bit free. Do you know what I'm talking about? The cross.
so, we, we will look at a topic in the class, finish the whole solving in that class. We don't listen to what the man is saying, but the man is not making any sense. So we finish the topic in the class. Nobody joins us. We do competition. Who solves one first? And we solve 20 questions on that class. We are doing that. When I came to medical school, I said, Lord, you need to use me. And you see, cross came. The first exam, I think I had shoe size. I don't know. I think I had 50 on dot. 50 on dot. Ah. 50 on. I said, I said, wait, though. And this means that what I knew the man. I thought that was good. I, I passed. At least 50 on dot in medical school. I passed. So, ah. so 49. Fifty. Nobody offend anybody. Lecturer, I take fifty. Me, I take fifty. Everybody's fine. No problem. You know, a, a, a daughter of mine told me yesterday that she's called fifty something. She's sad. She said, ah, medical school. That you be, you be, you be shout hallelujah. Then I give you forty-seven. You know that the, you know that it's more than fifty is a blessing. You know, the next exam, I told my friends what will come out. No, I have gifted it in the spirit. I said this question will come up. That is a GIT GS physiology. I told Choko, I told the Bunu, I told them what will come out in the exam. And those questions came out that same way. You know, you know what's what in my mind? You don't blast. No then I'm gonna mark it in Pluto. Bro, when the result came, hey. in the theory, I scored 18 over 50. This is the theory that I said. I knew well. My question is, so if I didn't know it, if I didn't have the answer before, maybe I was called like two. So I went to God. I said, God, let's talk. If I offended somebody, let me know. I can't, I can't kill anybody. But I was, I was praying. God said, John chapter 15, a tree that bears fruit. Say, I prune it to bear more fruit. I said, how does that concern cons- my cause? Are you pruning my scores too? He said, when you prune a tree, do you prune only one side? Does it affect the entire tree? I said, yes. He said, so you are ready for the pruning. I'll keep putting the pruning fork. So that day I knelt down. I said, God, I conclude today I don't have a brain. JB, it's not that I have a brain, I have to do an exam. Help me. So I came to the end of myself. But you see, after that time, I mean, not miss going this. It's not that I, I just scored one day, I just scored 60. One day I was called 70, one day I was called 55. So, you know, I got to a point where the outcome, you know, I was more interested in the outcome. In the glow, ah, the old bracky who was teaching medical students in order level, you know, he, you know that, that mentality first died. Maybe it's really like scoring 60 that you'll be shouting. Anyway, I just pray to God to score 50 on the other. Let me just call 51. No, 51, let me go, let me go, let me just call 51. So, when I score 70, I said, hey, ha, I bring. In neurophysiology, I scored, I scored more than everybody in MCQ. I was the highest in MCQ in the whole class. I said, ah, eh, I still have brain. I said, eh. So, no. I, I came to a point of perfect, perfect dependency. I now knew that when the cross, see, when the cross will not pamper your ego, the cross will kill it. It will kill your strongest point. That thing that makes you think you are a champion. When the cross comes, it begins to, eh. And it's not between you. You can cry. The more you cry, the more it kills you. Sometimes it's to even not stop crying. What am I saying, friends? That experience shaped my destiny. So it doesn't matter who you are, you come around me, find help. You fail or you pass. I became the reference point of who that failed. My book, the great knows now. My book failed in 400 level. I'm the custodian of instruction. If you come and meet me, you will pass your receipt. Though. You don't burn that receipt. Even this guy that had something. Even me that was answering it, I didn't have faith that you passed. The guy passed. I said, you, you passed. He said, so Holy Spirit, so this is what you are trying to do so that I can have the tongue that can address people's matter. And you have to go this extra man. I said, thank you. So even anywhere I have, it doesn't matter who you are, be a failure, you will rise to a success. Because the cross has what? I've done it. When we allow the cross, we are going to be more productive. If we don't allow the cross, whatever we are going to be learning now, as our Father is in our midst, may not be so, may not be so profiting. Because without a man bearing the cross, you can't pay sacrifice. The cross makes you pay because you see what we are going to learn comes with sacrifice of time, of resources, of dedication and commitment and faithfulness. 
and as pray now. I hear the Lord say, where are those individuals who are going to allow me to deal with them? Can you hear what I said? Do you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying individuals that won't go to rub their head. No, no what? No, no, what? To deal with them. I found out when the cross is at work, productivity is inevitable. When the cross is at work, what did I say? To be productive and effective is what is inevitable. All that we are crying to God for, Lord, move the nations. Those things are not difficult for God. The question is, where are those dying men? Where are the sisters on whom the cross has come upon? That because of poor maid, they will not be crying. Because they don't have what their other friends have. That is enough to make them think as if God doesn't like them. No. When the cross comes, he begins, the cross will visit your strongest point and begins to crush it. Thought that you what you will be, you will bend. And I tell the disciples, you don't need to go to what I went through. Telling you alone is enough. Submit all to Jesus. Our friends, God wants to multiply his life in us. Jesus wants to do the impossible with our lives. That's the reason for this weekend meeting. And I give you five minutes to respond. Less than five minutes to respond. To say, Lord, in the cross, be my glory. Let the cross begin to take effect upon my life. I allow your cross. I allow the cross. I allow the cross. Sometimes the devil makes us see you cannot trust God. Let me tell you, God can be trusted. What the devil be painting is to look as if if God start dealing with you, you will know he knows how to he knows how to do. And when the cross begins to walk, God, when the cross begins to take effect, you see. There are hidden potential, there are capacities in our spirit that cannot come to the land. I say, what? There is a crush. That song says, In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. You cannot see new wine when there's no crushing. Do you want to see the glory of God blow over your life? The cross must have effect. The cross must defeat anything that stands in the way of Jehovah. The cross must defeat any perspective that is not of God in your heart. Show me how, show me where, show me with whom, and I'll do it. If you pray that, don't be surprised if your whole life turns upside down. Because that's what happened to me. When I prayed that, the Lord began to connect me with disciple makers. I began to learn about disciple making movements where disciples were multiplying even in North Africa where this day maybe you haven't heard about it and so the Lord connected me with a network of disciple makers and basically all the pieces to the puzzle you know the thing I had prayed and said Lord what's
you will see how easy that is. Actually, let me grab. And when he said that, let me tell you the similarities. In a synagogue system, they had a synagogue ruler. You see that when you read the Gospels, right? The synagogue ruler. That's very much like our pastor position, the man in charge, right? And then they met once a week for an hour or two. Isn't that like what we do in our church buildings? Yeah. And they met on Saturday morning. We meet most of the time on Sunday morning. When they met, first of all, they would have a building. They built a physical structure to have their meetings in. Isn't that what we do in our church, right, our traditional church system? And then they would, they would gather together, and they would have a time of prayer, they would have a time of worship. Someone would read some scriptures. Someone would share a message. They would take an offering, and they would have announcements, and they would go home. Does that sound vaguely familiar to anyone? Isn't that exactly what we do in our church-based system today? Yeah. So I believe that Jesus was saying... I am bringing a new spiritual operating system 
and it is going to be expansive. It's going to have consistent, constant expansion. And because of that, because it always is expanding, you cannot put it inside of a rigid system, a rigid structure. Does that make sense? I was in northern Uganda a couple of years ago. I was doing uh, this training, and we were in a small, mud-walled, grass-roof church building. One of those where the mud walls only came up about this high, and then the, the grass roof came down like this so the air could blow up underneath. And it was designed to hold about 50 people. And there were 70 people in, in, in the building that day. They were just packed in there, just shoulder to shoulder. There wasn't even room for the, for the babies to crawl around on the floor. It was so, so many people crammed in there. And I said to them, how many of you know someone out in the world that you could invite to church and bring back here tomorrow? And they all, and, and they all did. They all said, oh, yeah, I know somebody. I know a neighbor, a coworker, or whatever that I could bring here. I said, if, you, if every one of you brought another person tomorrow, what would happen to our structure? They said, we, it would be broken. It would be too small. We don't fit. You see? This is expansion. Every time we create a rigid structure to hold the church, we limit the church's ability to grow. Does that make sense? Now, what I'm going to show you the rest of today, and you're going to, you're going to spend time in the Bible, you're going to be uh, looking at this yourself, I'm going to show you that Jesus' operating system is the new wine. We are, as disciples who multiply, we are the new wine. And the new wine skin is the world. See, the new wine skin is the thing, the, the container that holds the new wine. And, and if we build rigid buildings and structures to try to fit our disciples in there, we will always limit the growth. Amen? Amen? One of, one of the pioneers in disciple-making movements went so far as to say, buildings kill movements. You want to have a movement, or do you want to have buildings? Because you can't have both. Amen? That's not to say all buildings are bad. We'll talk more about that. You can use your buildings correctly. So I taught... I taught all of those 70 people, I taught them this process called the Discovery Bible Study, which is the process that the Holy Spirit gave to David Watson in those years of, of turmoil after he had lost his whole team. And then I had them go outside and practice doing a Discovery Bible Study under a tree. There's a video on my Instagram of that happening. So there's about 16 little groups sitting under 16 trees. And we might even do that here today. I see a lot of trees out here, and they all have shade. So maybe we'll let you go practice being the church under a tree. Amen? Because once you realize you can be the church anywhere, you don't need a religious building to, to be the church. All you need is two or more gathered in the name of Christ, right? Anywhere. It actually says in the original Greek, the word there, where two or more are gathered, it says congregated. What do we call the group that meets on Sunday morning? The con
millions of people around the world use in their Because if you're a I want you to find a blank, just turn to the next blank page, and the title is Group Discovery Bible Study, okay? And I'm going to give you this process because this is the process that millions of churches around the world are using every single time they meet, and they multiply like rabbits, Amen? And they don't just make Christian church members, they make obedient disciples that reproduce. And that's what Jesus requires of his followers. Amen? All right, so. How can we help? The group helps the group get through life. Okay, then the next question is for week two and every following week, and it is, how did your sharing and obedience go? You're going to be expected to share what you learn. You're going to be expected to obey what you learn. So the question is, how did your sharing and obedience go? And this afternoon, you'll be practicing this maybe under a tree. Praise God. Okay. And the next question I guess it's a statement. Read the Bible passage through at least two times. So you're going to read through the entire passage at least two times. You can read through it five times if you want, but at a minimum of two.
I know this is kind of boring right now, just going through writing all this down, but I promise you when you actually engage in this process with a group of people and the Word of God, you won't think it's boring anymore. Praise God. Because the Lord will come and he, 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 he will teach you uh, from His Word. Okay, so what was the last one? What stood out to you and why? Okay, so the next question is, how will you obey this passage? How will you put this into practice in your own life? How will you apply this to your life, right? How will you obey? When and where would you like to meet again? Many of these groups do not meet in the same place every time they meet. Sometimes they move around from house to house, for example. So when and where would you like to meet again? Amen? And it's important to establish that at the gathering... Because otherwise people scatter and sometimes people get missed and someone forgets to tell someone and people's feelings get hurt. and you know. So just establish at the end of every meeting when and where will we meet again. That way it's more likely to continue to happen. Amen? Because the devil would love to have you not do this. The devil doesn't want you to meet, doesn't want you to study the Bible, doesn't want you to apply it to your life, doesn't want you to share it with others. So the devil will work to try to keep you from meeting in these groups. Praise the Lord. Not praise the Lord that the devil will try to stop you, but praise the Lord that you know the devil will try to stop you so you can resist the devil, and he will flee. Praise the Lord. All right, so can you give me this process back? What's question number one? What are you thankful for today? Good. Question number two. What are you concerned about today? Excellent. Question number three. How can we help with these concerns? Question number four. How did your sharing and obedience go? Excellent. Question number what? Five. Read the entire passage at least two times. If you're with people who cannot read and write, if you're with people who we would call them illiterate, but I, I run into people like that in, in you know some of the remote areas where they don't read, they don't write. So then the one person who can read and write will read the passage several times until all of them can read back. The, the goal there is memorization, because that's their only way to, to remember things. They can't write it down. And you may run into that in Nigeria, too. Okay. So the next question. Right. Someone retell the passage in your own words. See, this is preparing you for sharing it with someone. If you can't explain, if you can't, if you can't retell a scripture in your own words, it means you don't understand it either. And if you don't really understand it, you're not going to feel competent and comfortable trying to share it with someone else. Am I right? Right. So that's why you share it in, in your own words. And, and uh, what's the add-on to that one? Right. Group can fill in the, the missing details. Imagine if we, if we went to an art museum and I took a, a, a painting off the wall and I held it down, and then I, I held it up to all of you and let you look at the painting, and then I put it back down and said, what did you see? You would each have some details, but some of you would see different parts. 
I've actually done that. If, if there were a picture on the wall, if I'm in a, in a place where there is, I'll do that and I'll say, okay, tell me what you see. And then we'll put the picture down. And the group can recreate the picture, but no one person ever can. So in the same way, no one person ever gets all the details in a Bible passage, but the group usually gets all the details. Does that make sense? Okay. And then the next question. Say that again. Ah, what do we learn about God from this passage? Excellent. And then the next question is, what do we learn about people? And don't forget to look at yourself, right? Don't just look at others like, oh, I read this passage and I think about my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, my, you know, think about other people, but analyze yourself in light of the Word of God. Amen? And then the next question, what stood out to you and why? This is usually where the Holy Spirit wants to point something out to you. That's why it stood out to you. I've done this several times with groups and, and, and you'll have five different people have five different details that stand out to them because that's the thing the Holy Spirit's pointing out to that person which proves a couple of things. One, it proves God exists. It proves that the Holy Spirit is highlighting the Word of God to different people in different ways, which means He's real. He's there. He's interacting with you. What's the next question? How will you obey this passage? Excellent. And next? Who will you tell and when? Excellent. Yeah, it has to be measurable... Also, the obedience has to be measurable. Like if I study the passage that says, uh, love your enemies, and I say, I will obey this passage by loving people better. That's not measurable, is it? How do you know if I loved somebody better or not, right? But if I say, you know, I have this relative who hates me, or this neighbor, or this coworker." But I know what their favorite, what their favorite dessert is, or I know what their favorite meal is. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make them their favorite food. I'm gonna bring it to them on Tuesday, after work. See, that's measurable, right? So you have to make it measurable. Otherwise, there's no way to know if it happened or not. Okay. And then the next question. Who do you know in need, and how can we help them? There are people in need all around us. Not, just, not just, just spiritual needs, of course those are there, but also physical needs. You'll see people who their, their roof is leaking, or their car isn't working, or they've got some problem. And, and you just say, you know, I've got a neighbor, a co-worker, a friend, a relative, and they have a need. Even if they don't know Jesus, even if they don't have any interest in Jesus, but you coming and helping them, just because they are a a creation of God, they bear the image of God, you're going to help them. You can create interest in people. They say, what? Wow. Why are you like this? Why are you doing this? Why are you helping me? And, they, and they create, it creates a curiosity. So then, potentially, you can make that person and their friends and family into disciples as well. Amen? Okay, last question. When and where would you like to meet again? Awesome, awesome. Praise the Lord. Um, I, I want to give the Lord uh, just a, 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 a clap offering for how well you guys got that process. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's a little more of a struggle, but because you're mostly students, you did, a, you did an excellent job with that. So thank you. All right, we're going to, again, this afternoon, we're going to give you a passage. We're going to break you up into small groups, and you're going to get a chance to go through that Bible study process so that when you leave here, you feel comfortable doing it with other people. Because this isn't just a teaching today. This is a training. Imagine if, imagine if the militaries of the world only did their trainings in a classroom. And then they come up against the Taliban or Boko Haram or the, they can't, right? They can't, they wouldn't even know how to do battle because everything was in a classroom. It's all, it's all just instructional. It's all just 
accumulating knowledge. So today, we're going to work on accumulating practical tools and skills that you can use to multiply the kingdom of God in your world. Amen? All right. Do I have to keep track of time like when, when uh, okay, because I have two sessions back to back, so I'll just run them straight through. I'm not going to, okay, good, good, good. All right, praise God. You just let me know what time is lunch, and then I'll quit. All righty. Now, so the next session, oh, excellent. Gosh, you guys are on top of it. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's, that's great. Um, so the next, actually, that was the introduction. So now we're going to talk about what does it mean to be a disciple. Who is a disciple is what it says in your, in your book, right? Who, and I put down what. What is a disciple? Because most people don't know what a disciple is. They, they you know, they, we kind of think a disciple is just a better Christian church member. Don't we? Right? So people will say, well, you know, Christian church members, they come to meetings when the meetings are happening and they give some of their money into the ministry of the church, into the offering, and maybe they volunteer in the programs, maybe they teach Sunday school or they watch the kids or they cook food or they do something, they clean, clean the place or trim the bushes. And, and we kind of think, well, if I'm making a disciple, then I'm just going to make somebody do those things better, go to church more, maybe sit closer to the front, Maybe put more money in the basket. Maybe volunteer, you know, teach Sunday school and clean the building, right? Isn't that kind of how we think? Like, what is a disciple really? But here's the thing. Jesus had a specific definition of disciple that he knew what it meant. And all of his disciples knew what it meant. But most of us don't know what it meant. Most of us don't have a clue in the church today, what, what Jesus meant when he used the word disciple. But if we don't know what Jesus meant when he used the word disciple, how in the world can we fulfill the Great Commission? We don't even know what we're aiming at, right? Imagine, imagine that one of you put a blindfold on me and handed me a bow and a big barrel full of arrows, and then you put a target on the wall in this building somewhere. And you told me, hit the target with an arrow while I have a blindfold on. How long is it going to take me to hit that target? Forever, right? I'll never hit the target because I don't know where the target is. I don't even know what I'm aiming at. But that's how it is in the church world when it comes to discipleship today. Most of us have no idea what Jesus meant when he used that word. So I'm here today, right now, to explain to you what that word meant to someone in the day of Jesus. How many of you understand the game of football? Is that, what's the most popular sport in, in Nigeria? Is it football? Football? Do you call it soccer in America? But I think it makes more sense to call it football because you hit the ball with your foot, right? I don't know what soccer means. So what's the man called who stands in front of the net? The goalkeeper. And what's it called when the ball gets past him and goes into the net? It's a goal. And uh, what's the person called who, who's on the front line who's trying to make the goal? The striker, yeah. And, uh, and what, ha what happens if one of, the, one of the players in the field touches the ball with their hands? That's a foul. And, and what happens if the ball goes out of bounds? Uh, yep. Yeah. And what's who's the only person who's allowed to touch the ball with their hands? The goalkeeper. Wow. So you guys all understand the game of football, don't you? Now, raise your hand if you went to football school to learn that. None of you? So how did you learn all the rules of football if you didn't go to football school? How? Yeah, from watching it, right? Did you ever play it? How old were you the first time you played football? 
Like two? As soon as you could walk, right? Okay. But they had disciples. They had discipleship. And there were as many as a thousand rabbis who were walking around Israel in the days of Jesus. Jesus was one choice among a thousand. And don't miss this point. Because even in our world today, we can mistakenly make disciples of our favorite author our favorite YouTube preacher, our favorite, you know, building-based preacher, our favorite doctrine, and we can miss making disciples of Jesus and make disciples of something or someone else. Amen? That's how it was in Jesus' day. There was actually this rule book. You know how there's a rule book for, for, for football? Right? And who writes the rule book? The officials, right? The the officials, the, the people who are the highest up in the national level in football, they write the rule book and they make the rules for football. Well, in Jesus' day, there was a law of the rabbis. It's called the rabbinical law. Maybe you've heard that term before. And it was the rule book for discipleship, between the, the relationship between a disciple and, and his rabbi. Too often in our church world today, The coaches are the ones playing the game. <laughs> and, the, uh, and the team is sitting on the bench or in the stands. Watching, right? How many of you would watch football? This isn't, isn't the, uh, the um, what's the, there's, I see football like championships going on right now. Yeah, so there's a lot of, um, I'm getting advertisements on my phone to watch Nigerian football games. I think there must be something big happening. Um, and we clap for them. And, but that's not the goal. That's not what God has. God wants us to be the team that is playing the game. And the shepherds, the rabbis, Jesus at the top are coaching us and mentoring us as we do that. Amen? Praise God. Okay, have a, let's see. This session goes till one. Excellent. Okay. Good to know. Perfect. All right. So I'm going to show you the, the five primary characteristics of a disciple, uh, of a rabbi in Jesus' day. Before I show you those five, I want you to understand. So let me just use my chair here for a second. So imagine that I'm Matthew, and I'm sitting at my tax collector's booth. And as I'm sitting at my tax collector's booth, what is my job title? Tax collector, right? And if you read the story, it says that Jesus walked by and said, follow me. It doesn't even say that Jesus stopped. He just walked past him and said, follow me and kept walking. Now, Jesus does that because it forces you to make a decision. He's not going to stand there and wait. He just says, Matthew, follow me. And then he just walks off. Matthew has to go, oh my gosh, what do I do? Do I, do I stay in my chair? Do I follow Jesus? Do I stay in my... Do I? So, he, so he jumps out of his chair and he gets in line and he starts following Jesus. Now, 
People in the culture watching Matthew He doesn't know any of Jesus' teaching. All he knows is a rabbi walked past my booth with some disciples following him, and he invited me to join. people you can, dis you can disciple people who don't yet know Jesus who haven't yet surrendered their lives to him and that opens up a whole multitude of people as potential disciples I don't know it seems like it's fading is it fading yeah, it's on off on off do you have a I don't know do you have a new battery or is this okay All right, here come the microphones. All right. I don't know. It seemed like it was fading to me. I don't know if you guys could notice that where it was, I was gone. But now what was I talking about? Remind me. Yes, right. Thank you. Disciple people who are not yet saved. Um, you know, just quickly, when I ask people when Peter got saved, most of the time they say they don't think he got saved until after the resurrection, after he went back to fishing and Jesus restored him at the Sea of Galilee in John chapter 21. They think, yeah, that's probably when he got saved. Some people have some other ideas. I don't really know. It doesn't really matter. But we know Peter began following Jesus and somewhere along the line he got saved and he continued to follow Jesus after he got saved, right? Right? You'd agree with that? A little bit easier one is I ask people, when do you think Thomas got saved? Come on. I can, I can tell. What do you, when do you think Thomas got saved? Yeah. When he put his hand in Jesus' side, when he put his fingers in Jesus', in Jesus wrist, because just before that, a week before that, he said, unless I put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Well, is that a, is that something a saved person would
like to read that for us? Okay. Yep, he's got a mic for you. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Awesome. Thank you so much. It says many of his disciples went back or turned away or left him, and they didn't follow him anymore. Do you think that the culture would still call them disciples? They go back to fishing and making bread or whatever their job is, farming, sheep, taking care of sheep? No. No, because they were, and, and, and Jesus, after that, Jesus looks at his 12 disciples and he says, do you want to leave too? He's giving everybody the opportunity. Look, if you don't want to be here, I don't want you here. If you don't want to follow me, if my teachings become too difficult, there's the door. And so if disciples say, this is too difficult, I don't want to stay, you just have to let them go. Jesus did. Amen? Praise God. Okay, so we have to look at how to make a disciple. Jesus gave us a process how to make a disciple. Now, here we are. We're meeting in a building. And... Um, if, if, if you came to this um, property and all the materials for this building were sitting in a pile over here in the, in the yard to the side, would you be able to build this building if all you had was a pile of materials and no, no blueprint, no plan? No, because you need both a blueprint and a plan or, or a, blu a blueprint and the materials to make the building. If somebody hands you a blueprint, they hand you a plan to build a building, and, and they give you no materials, can you build the building? No. You need both the plan and the materials. So Jesus gave us both. He gave us the plan how to make a disciple, and he shows us what is a disciple. And the rabbis of Jesus' day also have written down, so we can look at the rabbinical law, even though it's not in our Bible, you see examples of discipleship in your Bible once you understand what, what the five characteristics of a disciple were. So, let's start with those five characteristics. So, number one, and if you're taking notes, you're going to want to, I tell you this, and if you don't agree with him, you, you, you can't be his rat or you can't be his disciple. So one of the things Jesus said is he said here, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, if a, if a man even looks at a woman with lust in his heart, he's committed adultery with her already. Now imagine Jesus finishes his sermon and Thomas comes up to him and he puts his arm around him and he says, Jesus, that was a really good sermon. Good job. Uh, but that thing about adultery, I don't, I don't quite buy that. I think I'm going to keep watching porn, and I'm going to keep lusting after women in my work and my neighborhood. And But can, I'm going to still be your disciple. Is that okay? What do you think Jesus would say? No. No. You can't disagree with your rabbi on any of his interpretation of the Old Testament and remain in right relationship with your rabbi. Does that make sense? So there's a place where Jesus said, it's um, the food you eat. He says, it's not what comes into you that makes you unclean, it's what comes out of you that makes you unclean. And Mark said, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. So if Jesus declared all foods are clean now, we don't have the right to go around telling people this is clean and this is unclean and this is clean because we're dis disagreeing with our rabbi, right? On the issue of marriage, Jesus said, have you not read in the beginning, right? God made them male and female, and a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. What God has joined together, let man not separate. That's Jesus interpreting a whole bunch of things about there are two genders, male and female. In my country today, they think there are like 18 genders. There are two. And divorce is something God is not in favor of, right? Right? 
He says, what man has separated, or what God has joined together, let man not separate. So when a man and woman become united, become married, they become one in the sight of God, and God says, don't separate that. I've, I've, I've created that. So if I'm going to be his disciple, I don't have the right to disagree with him on that, right? Right. So those are just a few examples. There are many more. The fourth characteristic of a disciple is that you would imitate the actions of your rabbi. So write that in your notes. Imitate the actions of your rabbi. My favorite example of this is found in the, the story of Jesus walking on the water. You all know the story. But I want you, somebody read Matthew 14, verse 28. Just verse 28. I want, to, I want you to see something here. Oh, microphone, please. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Amen. Thank you very much. Peter said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Do you hear the word if there? Lord, I'm not sure it's you, but it might be you. It looks like you and it sounds like you, but it's also floating on the lake. I've never seen you float on the lake before. Maybe it's a deceiving spirit sent here to harm us. We don't know. So Peter devises a plan because Peter knows the rules of discipleship and he knows that Jesus knows the rules. And the rule is your rabbi empowers you to do everything he can do. Imitate the actions of your rabbi through the empowerment of the rabbi. Amen? So Peter makes a test, and he says, okay, if it's really you, then uh, just make the water hold me up too. Jesus says, come on. So Peter, you know, jumps out of the boat. Wow, the water's holding him up. He starts walking toward Jesus, but then he made a mistake, didn't he? What was his mistake? He what? He doubted. He chose fear. And why did he doubt? Why did he choose fear? What was he looking at? Ah, he was looking at what was going on around him, the wind, the waves. He was looking at his circumstances instead of focusing on Jesus, right? Okay, now don't miss this. While he was focusing on Jesus, he was empowered to imitate Jesus, right? And when he took his focus off of Jesus and put his focus on the circumstances, then he sunk down into those circumstances could have drowned right he says lord save me in this part it amazes me the water right in front of jesus is drowning peter and the water under jesus feet is strong enough to hold up jesus and for jesus to pull peter up out of that water it's like jesus is standing on the edge of the pool and peter's right in the edge drowning it amazes me so as you follow Jesus and you encounter difficult circumstances, the wind and the waves, whatever those are, don't look at the, don't look at the circumstances. Look at Jesus. And then you can imitate Jesus. And I mean this in a very real and practical way. When you're, in, when you're um, face to face with a, a person who has an evil spirit, don't look at the evil spirit. Don't focus on the evil spirit. Focus on the Jesus who will empower you to imitate him and cast out the evil spirit. Amen? When you're encountering someone who has a sickness, don't look at the sickness. Just look at Jesus who can cure the sickness. And in the power of Jesus, he will empower you to cure the sickness. Amen? Amen? How many of you have ever seen a demon cast out of someone? Okay? Put your hands up nice and high so I can kind of see how many. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay? How many of you have heard a story about a demon being cast out of someone? 
course. How many of you believe Jesus can still cast out evil spirits today? Amen. What about healings? How many of you have seen someone be healed in Jesus' name? Oh, most of you. Praise God. How many of you are the one who said it, who said, be healed in Jesus' name? I see a few hands. Excellent. Yes. Praise God. When you encounter a dead person, don't look at the dead person. Look at Jesus who raises the dead. Amen? How many of you have seen someone get raised from the dead? Any of you? How many of you have? You have. Praise the Lord. Yes, so have I. How many of you have heard a story of someone get raised from the dead? Ah, most of you. Praise God. So you believe God still raises the dead today? Yeah. Amen. So tomorrow is Easter Sunday, and about, I'm going to say, five years ago, I was in somewhere in central India on Easter Sunday morning. So about five years ago tomorrow, and I was preaching a message on why Jesus rose from the dead. He rose from the dead, it says in Romans, so that we could be like him, that we're supposed to have the life that he had. We're supposed to be, you know, become um, like the, the image of Christ. We reach the fullness of the stature of Christ. We're, you know, it, it's just all through the Bible that we're becoming like him. And that's this topic of memorization or of uh, imitation. We imitate him, right? And so this particular church building where I was giving the Sunday morning message on Easter morning, it was in a community that was one-third Muslim, one-third Hindu, and one-third Christian. And the Muslims, they put those speakers on their towers, you know, and they broadcast their prayers. Have you guys all, have you heard that? So in this, in this community, they were given equal time to everyone. So the, the Hindus were allowed to broadcast whatever they wanted to broadcast for so many hours a day. The uh, Christians were allowed to broadcast whatever they wanted to broadcast for so many hours a day. So on Sunday morning, they translated my message into the local language and broadcast it through loudspeakers over this whole community that was a third Muslim, third Hindu, and a third Christian. And I talked about how Jesus gives us the power to imitate him, to raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons, preach the gospel, oppose dead religious systems, all the things Jesus did. And I finished the message as soon as I said the closing prayer, I said, Amen, I heard a blood-curdling scream come from the side to my left. Just this, the scream that you would hear if a, if a mother just found her baby dead in its bed. Because a mother had just found her baby dead in its bed. Baby was less than two years old, maybe about a year old. The mother comes running out of her house with this little baby. It's naked, and it's gray, and it's cold, and it's not breathing. But she had just heard that message. So she, see, she looks at me. The door was open. It'd be like this door right here. The door was open, and she looks right at me. And she runs at me with her baby. She stops in front of me with this baby, and I, 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 you know, I'm like, oh, my goodness, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And then the Holy Spirit's like, well, what did you just preach? Right? And I knew that this was a test from the enemy. I knew the devil was going, okay. In America, we say, put your money where your mouth is. Right? So I, I, I put my hands on the baby, like I said. Now, I'm not a doctor. I didn't, I didn't take a pulse. But the baby was cold. And its skin was gray. And it wasn't moving. And it wasn't breathing, and its eyes were rolled back. They were about half open, and you just saw the, the whites of its eyes. And so I just said, and some other people gathered around. I, as far as I know, I'm the only one who said anything, if I remember it correctly. But other people, you know, came in a circle, gathered around, and I said, in, in, the, in the almighty name of Jesus, I speak life and health and wholeness to you. And then they took off. They jumped in a car, and they shot off to the hospital. Well, it was Easter morning, so there was very little traffic. They got to the hospital in five minutes. They brought the baby into the hospital, and the doctors examined the baby, and they couldn't find anything wrong. Praise God. All glory to Jesus. All glory to Jesus. 
That night I was staying in a host home, and the woman of the house was treating me extra special. And I had to ask her, I said, why are you treating me so special? And she said, because I'm the woman who held that baby on the drive to the hospital. She said, I felt warmth come back into that body. I, 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 the, I felt the baby take a breath and begin breathing. And in those five minutes, that baby was crawling around laughing and, and, and you know, just in the car like nothing was wrong. Praise God. Again, I'm not special, but the Jesus who empowers us to imitate him, he is special. Amen? And I could tell many stories like that, but for the sake of time, we will move on. Okay, so that was characteristic number four, right? Okay, the fifth characteristic of a disciple is that you would gather more disciples to your rabbi. If you are going to be a disciple, it's your job to constantly be looking for other people that you can bring to Jesus and help them become his disciples as well. And I want to show you this from John chapter 1. Now, we're going to read kind of a longer section here. It's about 12, John 35, 35, it's about 12 verses. And so I need somebody who's willing to read 12 verses and read them slowly. And as we read these verses, I want you to count how many disciples Jesus had. Because at the beginning of this encounter, Jesus doesn't have any disciples at all. But at the end of this encounter, he has accumulated a group of his, his first disciples and I want you to count both how many disciples he gets and who told them they should be Jesus' disciples. Amen? Okay, so John chapter 1, starting at verse 35. Who would like to be our reader? Okay, the sister. Day, they came the next day after John's two and two of his disciples. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples had him speak, and they followed Jesus. Okay, one, stop there. Then. Wait, wait. So, who, how many disciples did Jesus just get? Two. Who told them they should follow Jesus? John. This is John the Baptist. So John the Baptist had disciples of his own, and he, he sent two of his disciples to Jesus. So, you see, Jesus now gained two, and he called zero. Somebody else told them they should follow him. Okay, keep going. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and said unto him, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He said unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt. And abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is, being interpreted, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Okay, stop there. So did Jesus just gain another disciple? Who did he gain? Simon, and Simon Peter, right? Same guy? And who told Simon Peter that he should, that he should uh, follow Jesus? Andrew did. So how many disciples does Jesus have now? Three. How many did Jesus call? None. Okay, keep going, sister. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following Jesus would go the day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find that Philip and said unto him, Follow me. Okay, stop. So did Jesus just gain another disciple? What's his name? And who called him? 
Jesus did. So now how many disciples does he have? Four. How many did he call personally? One. Okay, keep going. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. You can stop there. Thank you. So he brings him to Jesus, right? So how many uh, disciples does Jesus have now? Right. And who told Nathaniel that he should follow Jesus? Philip did, right? So Jesus gained five disciples. He only called one of them. And the other four were sent to him or brought to him by other means. You see that? And that means that 20% of those initial disciples were called by Jesus and the other 80% were brought to him or sent to him by other people. Amen? So you and I, as his disciples, should always be looking for people that we can bring to Jesus. Jesus will still call some. You know, like he called uh, the Apostle Paul, right? Nobody went to Paul and preached the gospel to him. Jesus had to just knock him off his horse and blind him for a while and, and call him to himself. But the majority of disciples come to Jesus because someone else, a, a human being, another disciple, told them that they should follow Jesus. Amen? Does that make sense? Okay. Praise the Lord. So are you guys all okay? Everybody okay? We're supposed to, we're going to quit at 1 o'clock. And uh, I believe have our lunch at 1, right? It's 11.40, okay? Nobody needs a break? Five minutes, stand up, anything like that? No? I don't know. You guys good? Okay. Now we're going to get into, um, so those are the five characteristics of a disciple. Those are the five uh, primary things that made up a disciple. They're like the materials of a disciple. What is it you're trying to make? This is what it is. This is the target. This is what we're aiming for. So if we have ministries that are not making disciples according to this definition, we, our ministries are falling short of the standard that Jesus had when he gave the Great Commission. Does that make sense? Okay, praise the Lord. Now, we're going to look at the Great Commission itself. We're going to look at the process, this is sort of like the blueprint. How do we make disciples? How do we disciple the nations? Because Jesus knew that he was going to command his disciples to go disciple all the nations of the world, so he trained and equipped them to get them ready to receive the command to go make the disciples of all nations. And he's doing the same thing today. He's equipping us so that we can disciple nations as well. So, let's start with the Great Commission according to Matthew. So that, this is found in what? Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20? Who'd like to read that for us? Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus then spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm sorry to do this. Um, that's one place where the King James misinterprets uh, the... the the word there, it says, go and teach all nations. That's not what it says in the original Greek. There's a different phrase there. Um, I don't know why it's written that way. I think in the New King James, they have it right. But who, who has a different translation of the Great Commission? A non-King James or a newer King James? Anyone? You have a new King James. Okay, how does yours say it? Go therefore and make disciples there we go. Of, all of all the nations 
Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Make disciples. That's the word in the original Greek. It is mathetes. It is uh, the, the, the literal translation would be as you go, disciple. Like as you go through life, disciple. Disciple people. Disciple your world. Um, so... Cross that out and write make disciples in the margin. You can even go on Google and, you know, look what's the Greek, literal Greek of, of the Great Commission and make sure that I'm not lying to you, but that's what it really says in the original Greek. Make disciples. It doesn't just say teach them because there's more to being a disciple than just head knowledge, right? Okay, and then what's the next thing he tells them, tells them to do? Baptize them, right? Baptize them. And then what's the final command? Teach them. Okay, keep going. Ah, teach them to faithfully follow. Does anybody's translation read different than that? Teach them to? Observe or obey all things, everything that I have taught you, right? Now remember, he's giving this command to people who have memorized all of his teaching. So he's basically saying, go teach them to obey everything I've taught you to obey. Just duplicate yourselves, right? But it says, baptize them and teach them. And so, who do we baptize? Who do we teach obedience to I'm sorry disciples I'd like to read that Christ will be saved. For he who does not believe will be condemned. Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah, you can stop right there. Thank you. So, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, right? But what did he do before that? He said, go ye therefore and do what? Preach the good news to all creation. See, the word preach is something that Matthew left out. Thankfully, Mark put it in. So, this is the same event Jesus is giving his final commands to his 11 disciples on a mountaintop before he ascends to heaven. And he says that you are supposed to go, right? Both Matthew and Mark say go. And then Mark says preach the good news. And then Matthew says baptize them. but how many of you know what a participle is? Anyone? That's okay. Do you? Huh? Are you just making, you're just being funny, aren't you? She's just making a joke, I think. <laughs> okay, I'll stop focusing on you. Um, so a participle is a word that describes how to do something. And in the original Greek language of the Great Commission, when you look at the Great Commission according to Mark, and, and Matthew, you see that there's only one command actually given, and the rest are participles that describe how to obey the one command. It would be like if I told my children, 
clean the kitchen by wiping off the countertops, by washing the dishes, and by mopping the floor. What's the one command? Clean the kitchen. What are the three participles on how to clean the kitchen? Right. Mop the floor, wash the dishes, wipe the counter. Yep. So Jesus is giving four participles on how to disciple. The command is one, and it is disciple. The four participles are, and if you're taking notes, write these down. These are the four steps to making a disciple. It's very simple. It's very reproducible. It's very powerful. Step number one is what? What does it say in the Great Commission? Both Matthew and Mark tell you to go. Right. And then Mark says to do what? Preach. Right. You have to preach the gospel. How will they know unless they hear? Right. So we have to tell them. And then if they respond to the gospel, what do we do with them? We baptize them. And then what's the final participle? The final way to make disciples. Teach them. Teach them what? Well, yep, the gospel. But teach them to, to obey all the commandments of Jesus. Not just some of the commandments of Jesus, but all of the commandments. Some of them are easier to obey than others. Amen? Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Now, should we always be going? Should we always be in go mode in our mind? Where we're looking for people who are looking for God all the time? Right? Some of you might go across the street. And some of you might go across the world, but you should always be going and willing to go. Would you agree? Okay. And then the second command is to preach the gospel. How many of you feel comfortable preaching the gospel? You feel like I could lead somebody to Christ on the street today. Show me your hand if you feel comfortable preaching the gospel. Okay. Less than half of you. Maybe uh, less than a quarter of you. So I encourage you to improve your ability to preach the gospel. And those of you in leadership, I encourage you to, to teach them, equip them, even do like role-playing, you know, where you practice preaching the gospel because preach the gospel is a big part of the Great Commission. Amen? But let me tell you something. Jesus is a genius and he knows that we should start small and then take people higher, right? Right? When you preach the gospel, you don't have to start on the same level as Billy Graham. Or, or, or um, who was that guy from Germany who passed away recently? Um, gosh, we all know his name. Uh, Bonnecke, Reinhard Bonnecke, right? Bonnecke? Um, you don't have to start on that level. The first time Jesus preached the gospel, he said, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. How many of you think you could say that to someone? Come on, that it should be every hand, right? Unless you're asleep. Raise your hand if you're asleep. <laughs> okay, uh, let's all practice that. Everybody say, repent. The kingdom of heaven is near. I actually went into some remote areas of India where they'd never heard the gospel. They've never even heard the name of Jesus. And I... I did that. I used that simple phrase, and I said, hey, the, the God that created the universe sent me to you, and he wants me to tell you you need to repent. The kingdom of heaven is near. And you know what? In one case, a whole household came to Christ, and in another case, a whole town came to Christ. Praise God. Because the power of God was there. Jesus still works today the way he worked in the beginning. Now, the next thing he told them to do is what? Did I hear somebody say? Baptize them. That's right. Baptize them. Now, how long does it take to baptize someone? Five minutes? Most pastors say five minutes, and then I always say, can you hold your breath for five minutes? No, no. How long does it take to baptize someone, really? Just a few seconds, right? Right. How many of you have never been baptized since you believed. 
Show me your hand if you've not yet been baptized since you came to Christ. Okay, I've got one, two, anyone else? Okay, three, four, all right, five, six, seven, all right, eight, okay. Don't be afraid because this is just a matter of practicality. It's a matter of obedience. If you have not been baptized since you came to Christ, you should get baptized. Do you have a place in town where you baptize people? Okay, can you arrange in the next couple of days for these folks to get baptized? Okay, it's possible. So what, are they, what do I call you? Doctor, Dr. A, is that good? Pastor, shepherd, leader. I don't know what, the, I don't know what title to use, but my dear brother in the front, Dr. A. Is that okay? I like that. Also easy for me to say. Um, he said it's possible to do that baptism uh, in the next couple of days. Because if you're going to be a disciple who preaches the gospel and makes disciples and baptizes people, you have to be baptized yourself. Otherwise, you're a hypocrite, right? It, right? So I was doing this uh, teaching in, in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, for Dominion City. And uh, 26 people in the room had not been baptized. And when they raised their hands, the ushers quickly outside, they assembled a, ba a baptismal. It's like a snap-together baptismal, and they, they throw a big rubber tarp in there so it holds water, and they filled it with water. And at lunchtime, they baptized all 26 of those people. So they spent the second half of the day sitting in their chairs soaking wet. Praise God, though, right? I was doing this in Enugu, and 40 people had not been baptized. And so the next day, we went and baptized all of them. Because if you're going to be a disciple who makes disciples, you have to be comfortable with baptism. Amen? Now, here's a little more difficult question. How many of you have never baptized anyone? Show me your hand if you've never baptized anybody. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. You can put your hands down. I did this training in uh, Uganda, and um, I had just about 20 people. About 15 of them were women, about five men, 15 women, all about your age, in their 20s. And, um, and then when I left, you know, I hopped on, a, on an airplane. I flew back to the U.S. My airplane landed, and they say, you can turn your phones on. So I turned my phone on, and I had messages from the leader who had organized that training. And he said, brother, we have a problem. And I thought, oh, no, what, 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 what's the problem, you know? Oh, no, did I say something wrong? Did something... And uh, I said, what's the problem? He said, well, those ladies that you, that, you, that you trained, they went out and they led 70 people to Christ since you left. Wow, right? Praise the Lord. I said, um, that sounds like good news. What's the problem? And he said, well, they baptized them all. And I said, okay, that sounds like good news. What's the problem? And he said, well, the local church leadership, sort of the Pharisees of the town, said women are not allowed to baptize people. And then he said, brother, what should we do? And I said, um, ask those local church leaders to show you all the passages that say that women can't baptize people. And until they produce those scriptures, you tell those sisters, keep up the good work. Praise God. As of today, those women have baptized over 2,000. My left is doing the baptizing, and the person on my right, your left, is being baptized, okay? Okay, so, so put your hand on your partner's shoulder and say, say, brother or sister, I baptize you 
In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Now push them underwater. Okay, now cooperate. You got to, yeah, come on. Go underwater. Go underwater. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look at this guy. Yeah. <laughs> the Bible, the Bible does not say you have to go this way. You can go this way. Or you can go this way. I've seen people baptized in a drainage ditch where the water's only this deep. And they come by and they push the whole body and make sure it all got wet, you know. Okay, now switch partners. So the person on this side is doing the baptizing. You say, brother or sister, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and push them underwater. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> Woo! All right. You may be seated. Wow. Now, how many of you feel after that little exercise? Now, how many of you are perfectly obeying all of Jesus' commands today? You never fail. Anyone? No. Good. None of us are there. None of us will ever be there. So the job of, of teaching them to obey all Jesus' commands, how long will that last? A lifetime. It's going to last the rest of your life. I want to show you, gosh, I've got several directions. Yeah, verse, um, actually it's verse 10. 
Matthew chapter 23, verse 10. Who would be willing to uh, read that one for us? Mm -hmm. Say that again. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. Ah, okay, so Jesus says, don't let anybody call you I might be confusing some things. John. No, I think I'm thinking of John. Where's the verse where Jesus says, you will receive the Holy Spirit and he will guide you into all truth? 14? Okay. 14 verse. Okay, 16 verse. What? and the Holy Spirit are working together to be your teachers. And I want to show you, I want to show you uh, one more verse. This is a verse that is sometimes avoided in our, um, in, in, in our old wineskin church systems, but it's 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. And I've never heard anyone preach on this verse, but I think it's important for us to bring it up. 1 John 2, 27. It's in the Word of God. We should. Abide in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Okay, read the first line again, because you didn't have a mic yet. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. So, on one hand, right, we're talking about shepherds. We're talking about God will raise up shepherds. And then this verse says that the anointing that you have received, which is what? It's the Holy Spirit. It says the, whole, the anointing that you have received will teach you all things so you don't need anyone to teach you. Now, how many of you have heard anyone preach on that passage before? Good, some of you? Yeah, because the, the anointing, it, 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 John is saying, you have the Holy Spirit. And because you have the Holy Spirit, you are not dependent on human teachers alone because God will also teach you. Amen? Praise the Lord. Now, I am not against human teachers because you might notice I'm holding a microphone and I'm teaching you right now. Right? If I was against human teachers, I would be against myself. I'm not against myself. But I want you to understand that there is a group of teachers available to you in the kingdom of God. That Jesus said... mandatory. Does that make sense? Let me give you an example. 
In the 1970s, there was something that took place in the country of Ethiopia. How many of you were not alive in the 1970s? Probably none of you, right? Were alive then? Um, I was a small child in the 1970s, and, and uh, a communist government took over the, the country of Ethiopia. And something, they called that the dirge. It's D-E-R-G. And you can look it up online, go to Wikipedia, learn about the dirge. It was a time when a communist military government took over in Ethiopia. And it said that it was preceded by what they called a red wave. And the red wave was the wave of blood that was spilled as this dirge, this, this military communist government took over. Now, up until that time, there were Christians in many denominations who had been working in Ethiopia trying to establish that old wineskin model of the church. So what they would do was they would find a piece of land, they would build a rectangular building on that piece of land, and they would build schools, Bible schools and seminaries to train their leaders how to run their religion inside those buildings that they built. That's the old wineskin model. And when the dirge came, the communist government, they killed all the pastors and they imprisoned all the elders and they burned all the church buildings and they confiscated the Bible schools and the seminaries to teach their own ideology and the church in, in one denomination they had grown in a hundred years of the old wineskin model of seminaries and buildings and training clergy and having the clergy run the meetings and run the religion they had only grown to 4,000 in their denomination in the whole country in a hundred years it's only 40 people per year nationwide. Then the dirge came. The pastors were killed. The elders were imprisoned. The church buildings were burned. The, the, the seminaries were confiscated, and the people went underground. They said, well, we can still read our Bibles in our homes. We can still help one another follow Jesus in our close relationships. That's something that they'll still let us do. So they went underground, and that's what they did. After 10 years, the heavy hand of the government lifted enough that they could come out of hiding and see how many were left. So if less than 4,000, because the elders and the pastors are gone, less than 4,000 went into hiding, how many do you think came out of hiding after 10 years? Anybody want to guess? A little over 2,000? 3,000? Okay, so you think the numbers stayed about the same in 10 years? How many came out? You think more or less? Like 200. 100? You said 200? Okay, so he thinks the numbers would have gotten smaller, smaller, smaller. Okay. What do you think? Hmm? I think they gave birth to more children. Like oh, gave birth to children. So you think in 10 years they would have had a few more because of babies? Okay. Anybody have any other thoughts? How many do you think would have come out of hiding? Hmm? How many did you say? Uh, 10,000 to 100,000, you said? Yeah. So your uh, shepherd here, he understands. They actually came out of hiding 40,000. Wow, 40,000. They more than... They grew by a multiple of more than 10 in just 10 years, what they couldn't achieve in 100 years doing it in the old wineskin way. Wow, right? Because they were forced to switch from the old wineskin model to the new wineskin model. And they were meeting in their homes and they were discussing the Bible and they were helping each other to, 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 to follow it and obey Jesus. And as they did that, other people noticed you know, a neighbor would notice, a co-worker would notice, hey, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're studying the Bible. And uh, we can't do it, you know, we can't keep growing our meaning bigger and bigger or we'll get in trouble from the government. So let's start another group in your house. 
right? And it grew, multiplied, small, small, under underground, under um, under the radar. Some people refer to this as the rabbit church and the elephant church. Have any of you ever heard that those, those terms? The elephant church and the rabbit church? I see one head nodding. Yeah? So sometimes when we're talking about the two different ways that people do church, we see that there's sort of an elephant model and then there's a rabbit model. These people, and it would be the same it would be the same as the old wineskin and the new wineskin. The old wineskin is your elephant model. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, grow very fast. And then your new wineskin is your rabbit model. Which the new wine has rapid expansion, and rabbits have rapid multiplication, right? So if you think about it, the average, in, in my country, I don't know what it is here, in my country, the average Christian church never has a baby. It never gives birth to another church. Only, only um, I think it's 4%, 4 out of 100 churches ever have a baby. They ever give birth to another congregation. And half of those happened because there was a fight. There was a church split. And they bust up, not on purpose, but because I can't get along with those people anymore. That's not what Jesus intended. It's not what we see on the pages of the New Testament church. I guess I didn't know where I'd be standing when I asked him to put that hand there. Um, on the other hand, rabbits, rabbits multiply very rapidly. They're small. They can hide easily, right? You all know that there's probably rabbits in this field right here, but you can't see them because they're hiding. And if somebody handed you a gun and there was an elephant and a rabbit running around in that field, which one would be easier to hit? The elephant, right? Because it's big and it's cumbersome and it's hard to miss. So in the same way, rabbits and elephants are a, a, a description of our church systems today. In real life, if you take two elephants and those two elephants want to have a baby, do you know that an elephant is pregnant for two years? And a female elephant can only get pregnant four times a year. You know, female humans can get pregnant 12 times a year. Elephants, only four. They only are fertile four times a year. And then if they get pregnant, it takes almost two years before the baby is born, and they only have one baby per pregnancy. Wow. And they don't even become sexually mature where they could have a baby until they're 18 years old. Wow. So if you want to multiply elephants, it is going to take a long, long time, right? You start with two. If you start with two babies, you got to wait 18 years before they can even get pregnant, and then you got to hit the right time when when the female elephant is fertile, and then she's pregnant, and then you got to wait two years, then she has a baby, and then you got to wait 18 years before that one could have a baby, right? This is a long, slow process, but this is how it is with planting churches in the old wineskin model. We think, oh, I need to find some land, and oh, I need to make a drawing of the building, and I need to raise money for all the materials to build the building, and it's very long, slow process. Am I right? How many of you have been involved in that process? Helping build a church, start a church, start a building, even this building. Do you own this? This building we're in, or are you, you renting this? Who owns this building? I'm sorry? Peace House? Okay. Yeah. So, so this building would have taken time to get the materials together and buy, you know, all the money to buy the materials and all of that. On the other hand, rabbits are almost continuously fertile. The only time a rabbit can't get pregnant is when she already is pregnant. 
And instead of having one baby per pregnancy, they have seven. Yeah, six or seven. And she's only pregnant for one month. Get pregnant on January and have the babies in February. Right? Whoa. And then their rabbits are sexually mature, meaning they can get pregnant at four months old. Not 18 years, four months old. So if you have two rabbits and you want to multiply rabbits, th this is actually the most efficient way to produce meat, by the way, in the world. More efficient than growing sheep, goats, cows, pigs, whatever else. Rabbits. Um, two rabbits can multiply to as many as, in three years, they can multiply to, how many do you think? Let's take a guess. What's a number? In, two, in, in three years, if you start with two rabbits and everything goes right and you have the right number of males and females, how many do you think they could multiply to in three years? How many? 20,000? 8,000? 8,000. 8,000. Okay. It's more than that. How many? Two million. Wow. Two million, he says. It's actually more than that. How many? Seven million? 3.7 million. Okay, it's more than that. It's actually 276 million. Two rabbits can multiply to 276 million rabbits in three years. I didn't believe it when I first heard it either. I have a friend who's an engineer. And he did the math, because he has the math for, remember, we're talking about exponential growth. The babies are having babies, and mom is still having babies, and the babies' babies are having babies, and mom's having babies, and the babies are having babies, right? The grandbabies have babies, the babies have babies, the grand, great grandbabies have babies. So that's what exponential growth looks like. It's not like you give birth and you stop. You keep giving birth while your babies keep giving birth. Amen? Praise the Lord. So if you hear me talk about the new wineskin church system, I'm also talking about the rabbit church system. They're, they're interchangeable terms. And I think that's what we see when we look at the New Testament. So now I want to I wanna take a moment. John chapter 6, verses 44 and 45. Just two verses. John 6, 44 and 45. And so I want you to look that up in your Bible. I want you to copy it word for word because that helps you memorize it. The reason we copy it is so that we cement it in our mind. Amen? And then write it down in your own words. And then how will you apply this to your life? And then who will you share this with? Amen? Does anyone have any questions on what we're about to do? Any questions? Okay. This usually takes about 15 minutes. So I'm going to give you 15 minutes to uh, fill out your worksheet. And then we'll come back together. Okay? You may begin. John 6, verse 44 and 45. 44 and 45. 
and I'm going to come around and get some pictures and video of you.
more time? About five more minutes? How many of you are finished? Okay. Yeah, we'll give you five more minutes. More than half of you still have to finish. Okay, praise the Lord. If you're not finished, just finish uh, on your break or finish tonight after our time together, okay? Now, we were talking about uh, our teachers, right? 
mind. That's going to fall. We're talking about our teachers. And who does this verse say is your teacher? God, right? God the Father, right? Wow. So we've seen that Jesus said, I'm your teacher, right? But he also Are they supposed to speak on their own? No. There's a verse, I don't know where it is, it says, if any of you speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. Right? Human teachers, speak what you learn from God. So, are you beginning to see what a large pool of teachers you have? You have human teachers. When they're available to you, learn all you can from them. I learn from human teachers as much as I can. But because I also learn from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I can discern when the human teachers are... He said, I thought it was my job to teach them everything. But what does it say in this verse? Whose job is it to teach you everything? God, the Father, right? I don't know about you, but when I first studied this passage, I was kind of shocked to find out that God the Father would teach me at all. Right? Is that kind of a shock to any of you today? Yeah, I thought he was too busy running the verse for me. So he, that's why he gave me the Son and the Holy Spirit and human teachers. But no, he's willing to teach you himself. Praise God. And Jesus said an amazing thing in this verse, and this is foundational for disciple-making movements. I don't want you to miss this. How many of you know that you have the gift of evangelism? Anybody here have the spiritual gift of evangelism? I think maybe you do, sir. Yeah? Anyone else? You? Okay. You? You? A few of you? Excellent. So you know that because you've seen God work in using you and what you say to lead people to Christ in a, a miraculous way. Wow. So in, in disciple-making movements, the best thing we can do for people is to teach them how to learn directly from the Father 
because then we have the highest success rate possible. Amen? Praise God. So the human teachers, the human shepherds, they're necessary, they're biblical. We're going to talk more about that after our break. But if you want to see the highest success rate, teach people how to learn from God and not just how to learn from you. Amen? Okay, so our time is almost up before break, but I want to hear from some of you. We have 15 minutes before our break. So some, let's have a few of you, a handful, volunteer. Tell us what you wrote down in your second... All four of the Gospels are the life of Jesus in the own words of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Yeah. So they retell what they saw and heard and experienced in their own words. That's all we're doing here. Praise God. Okay, who was next? Sister here? We'll get to you. You're about four. Praise God. Amen. Okay, I wrote here that it is the Father that gives me the sheep he wants me to pastor. I don't, mm -hmm. It is the father mm -hmm. that gives me the sheep he wants me to pastor. Okay. So I don't have a choice on who my disciples are. Mm -hmm. He decides who I disciple. Okay. Then I also write that um, it is the father's duty to bring them, mm -hmm. teach them, mm -hmm. and make them prepared for eternal salvation. Amen. My own role is just to pastor them to the Father consistently. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Yeah. Give her a hand. Your whole role is to pastor them or to shepherd them, right? Because pastor and shepherd, that's the same word in the Greek. And uh, if you think about how shepherds shepherd sheep, the sheep do a lot of their own feeding, don't they? The shepherd doesn't use a spoon and spoon spoon feed the sheep. He just puts them where the green grass is and they feed themselves. So thank you for that. God bless you. Who was next? Right back there. Yes, yeah, sister. I'm going to have to have a biological male also. Uh, thank you so much, sir. We appreciate <laughs> you. Jesus is saying in this passage that the only reason any man agrees to follow or accept Jesus is only if the Heavenly Father approves of it or causes his heart to yearn after him. Jesus also promises to grant resurrection unto that soul. So he said that on the last day, I will raise him up. And we know that we are already in the last days. And the Bible says that um, in the last days, like um, there will be fountains of living waters coming out of the bellies of people. So even in this dead world, we have people that have life because they believe in Jesus. Then in verse 45, it says in the prophets, it says that these men who believe shall all be taught of by the Lord. Mm. God will teach them through the ministry of the Holy Ghost. Everyone that hears his voice is his sheep, and his sheep knows his voice and follow him. There is also the spirit of discernment that allows you to know that this is the Messiah, the way, the truth, and the life, and you are drawn by the Father to follow. So as you told us, the spirit of discernment, um, you will know, okay, that this is the way I'm to follow um, that's what I got. Thank you so Praise much. Praise God. Give her a hand. Thank you. Okay, up here in the yellow was next. 
Okay, well, can we go to him because he's right there? And then you're next. Okay, thank you. Saves him some Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Uh, what I wrote down here is, uh, it is not given to any man to come to Christ except God grant them access. Uh-huh. And uh, the Bible made us to know that there are three that bear witness in heaven. It is the Word, the Spirit, and the Father. And when Jesus was baptized, uh, the Spirit made manifest there. And so, anything that we bring a man to Christ, it is the Spirit that convicts them through the Father to come to, the fa- to, the, to Jesus. And the work of, and the Bible made us to understand something that. Are, are, you, God, still, are you still reading or are you, I feel like you're starting to preach? <laughs> yes. <It's laughs> okay. Maybe you've got maybe you've got that gift. Okay. Um uh the Bible made us to understand that it is in the will of God from it, it pained God from creation that man left uh his presence and he has been wanting so it is in the real will of God for us to come back so he sent Jesus. So God put it in our heart to come to Jesus, mm-hmm. and Jesus grant us the access to the Father. And verse 45 there. And we just participate with God in his work of drawing people to Jesus. And so, you know, he's the one who draws them. Uh, he's the one Jesus is going to raise them up. He's the one who does the primary teaching. The Father is the source of all truth, and he will teach you through human teachers, through Uh, the Holy Spirit, through Jesus, and personally. uh, But ultimately, the work, the bulk of the work is is his, and we just cooperate with him. And I love this because it takes away the pressure. So many people have said, oh, I feel so much pressure to, you know, I've got to preach to so many people, and I've got to get so many people to pray the sinner's prayer, and I've got to write down their names and their phone numbers and the date that they received Christ. And it, It feels like spiritual sales, more than doing Jesus' work Jesus' way sometimes, doesn't it? And so this makes it feel like the pressure is off. And you actually will, by releasing the pressure and just doing Jesus' work his way, you'll see many, many more disciples made. You'll see much more fruit in your lives and ministries. Okay, was there anybody want to share um, who you will tell? Who do you know in real life that you will actually tell this verse to Like, oh my goodness, God will teach us. Oh my goodness, God's the one who draws people. I didn't know that. Did you know that? Who who will you tell? Sister. Mm -hmm. And then you'll be next, sir. Okay, the sister in the white. Praise the Lord. I actually wrote down here that um, I'll share this with everybody here and right now if I'm given the opportunity. So that was the first thing I wrote. Okay, praise God. Somebody who's not here, though. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's really hard. Okay. Not <laughs> given the opportunity. I'll share it with my friends and my roommates, and I wrote their names. Down okay. Cool. Here. Tell us their names. Precious, Mathilda, Dami, Femi. Okay. And when will you tell them? Uh, I wrote when I return. When you return? After this. So, week. like tomorrow? Yes. Monday? Tonight? When I get back Tom- to we're, we're finishing tomorrow, so tomorrow. Tomorrow night, Monday, something like that? Yes, sir. Okay, no pressure. Well, okay, some pressure. <laughs> um, who who can call her and ask her on Tuesday? How did it go? Will you? Do you, do you know her? You'll call. You know her number. Are you in the same apartment? Okay, so on Tuesday, put it in your calendar. Make yourself a note to ask her how did it go when you told your roommates this verse. Okay, this is a little bit of accountability. I know it feels uncomfortable, but we should be holding each other accountable to to be the disciples that God wants us to be. Praise God. Thank you. Give her a hand. Okay, and then there was a brother up here in the uh, poetic shirt. Am I reading that right? It's a P, right? Poetic. Okay. Thank you, brother. Amen. Uh, I will share it to everyone I have the opportunity to, like anyone I have the opportunity to, when I go out, maybe to my customers, Okay. Uh, to everybody, like this week leads me to uh, when he tells me that this so this person needs Jesus. Mm-hmm. So when I have the opportunity to, I will share to them. Yeah. 
Okay. Wow. Praise the Lord. So when somebody comes into your shop, God bless you. So when someone comes into your shop to buy something you bake, then you can say to them, hey, did you know? And then share this verse with them. Is that what you're telling us you'll do? Okay. And do you think that you'll share it with at least one customer this week, this coming week? Yes? I know I'm, it feels like I'm applying pressure because I am. Uh, who, who, who can ask you how did that go? You're sitting next to him, sister. Do you guys know each other? Are you friends? Okay. Can you ask him, today's Saturday, can you ask him on Friday, uh, how did it go? Did you share with a customer? Who did you share with? How did it go? Will you, will you do that? Will you put a note in your calendar? Okay. Praise the Lord. I know this seems a little crazy, but, it, you know, we have these tools on our phones, and we put notes in our calendars for all kinds of lesser things. So let's put them in for the higher thing. Amen? Praise God. Now it's time for us to break for our, for our uh, lunch time. And so I'm going to hand the microphone to someone else who's going to give you instructions and pray for your lunch. Amen? Praise the Lord. Should I? Praise the Lord. If you are clapping, can you clap better? If you are clapping, can you do that better for Jesus? In Jesus' mighty name. Can you ask the Lord in one minute that we establish this truth in your heart? He will establish this truth in your heart. Can you ask in a minute? Father, establish this truth in my heart. It's not just going to be as if I've just listened again, but beyond hearing, you will help me to go to practicing this truth. Can you ask the Lord that He will establish this truth in your heart? That you will be a doer of this war. You will be a doer. You will be a doer of this war in the name of Jesus that you will be a doer of this word of God that you will be a doer in the name of Jesus in Jesus mighty name we have prayed do you now understand what I was saying yesterday this is what I was saying yesterday that I was going to come into what body of word knowledge so when you see men try Men don't try by arrogance or ignorance. Try by what? Knowledge. Can you see what our Father has shown to us? So simple, right? Life is not difficult. See how it's easy to comprehend. You can, you can basically, uh, my friend, they said,